to just start with. Oh, yeah, I've got it. <laughs> I just want to say good afternoon um, and welcome to our first Zoom meeting event um, under, um, called Banter at the Boat House. And the first one, we are really going to look at uh, volunteering and we're going to look at it from both angles we're going to look at it from the angle of the volunteer and we're going to look at the benefits it offers to organizations as well my name is audrey wilson um, many of you will already know me i am partnership and engagement manager at scottish council and archives and on behalf of everyone behind the scenes i just want to say a huge welcome and thanks for you to come and join us this lunchtime just a little bit of background about today's interactive Zoom event. It's called Banter um, at the Boathouse, and it's part of an online study by Scottish Council and Archives, where we are following the journey of Ingrid Shearer and her team at Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, caring for an archive collection dating from around the 1850s. Um, it should be noted that the archive is a small part of a much bigger project which Ingrid is going to tell you a little bit about in a couple of minutes just after me. But before we hear from Ingrid, I just want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Many of you will be very familiar with this, but for everyone else, we are in a Zoom meeting format, which means that it's a much more interactive session and you can show yourself on screen and you can unmute. I ask you to keep yourself muted until the end where we have a Q&A session and very much encourage everyone um, to participate in that. You can do that in an, a couple of ways. You can either put your hand up, just wave like this, or there is the function keys at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little one that's a waving your hand. Or you can go into the chat and you can put a queue before your question. And that means I can ask the question to the sort of all the different speakers. Um, or you can ask to unmute yourself and we'd love to hear from you if you do decide to do that. Uh, we ask you to be kind and respectful when you ask your questions and to take part in the discussion. We really want to make sure that this is a lovely, friendly um, environment. So be conscious about what you say online. Don't say anything controversial or something that might upset someone. We are tweeting. Um, our Twitter handle is at Scott. We'll put it in the chat. Um, and also uh, you can include the Glasgow Building Preservation Trust handle as well. That'll go into the chat. That's at GB Trust. Um, and please do tweet away, uh, tweet away and we will also tag you into things in the future. So I think that's all from me. I'm going to pass you over now to Ingrid. Better unmeet myself. Uh, hi everybody, um, welcome and thank you very much for coming along. We've got quite a, a packed schedule today so I'm just gonna um, get underway uh, and tell you a little bit about the project. So I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, can you all see that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, I am the Heritage Engagement Officer for Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. Ingrid, We're, nothing uh, at the moment. Nothing. Oh, nothing at the moment. At the oh, moment. No. Hold on. It says you're sharing, but I'm not seeing anything. Oh. Mark's got his hand up, actually. Right. Hang on a second. I'll just uh, try that again. Typical, isn't it? Mark, if, right. you, if you want to say something in the chat, you want to do that. Okay. Um, can uh, oh, can you see frozen. that now? You're frozen. It's I. Can you see that now? Yeah, I can. Yeah. See. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it, Mark? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, she's frozen. Yeah. That might be your connection, though. If it's um, hang on. It's a bit fuzzy. Okay. Um, can you see that big image now of the boathouse? The boat yeah, house you're not in. You're not in presentation mode, so I can see oh. all your other slides. But it's a bit pixelated, I'd have to say. It's very right. pixelated. Uh, it might be our connection. Um, hang on a second. Uh, okay. Right. I'm going to stop the share for two seconds and I'm going to try to do, a indeed. method. Very sorry about this. I'm uh, like just, um, if everyone's not aware of the programme, what we're going to do is um, Ingrid's going to tell us a little bit about the, the project itself. 
and then we're going to hear from volunteers and there's lots of different volunteers we're going to hear from um, and then at one o'clock uh, we will then go over to Tessa Poller who is a lecturer in archaeology at the University of Glasgow and she talks about from an organization's point of view what are the benefits of volunteering and then we're going to have a short film about five minutes long from Make Your Mark which is all about it's a portal for people wanting to volunteer in heritage um, so it's also organizations but it's also people who are interested and it's bringing them together um, on one website if you like so we're going to hear about that and then we're going to have a Q&A session mm -hmm. and you can ask as many questions um, as you like or points for discussion maybe tell us a bit about your experience um, as a volunteer what were the good parts and maybe what were the not so good parts Ingrid, how okay. are you? Uh, I'm going to try it in Google Slides instead because uh, our PowerPoint seems to be having a bit of a um, breakout. Okay. So, in two seconds. <clears throat> Would it help if um, we turn right, the videos off? Uh, no, I'll, I'll give it a bash just okay. now. Very sorry about this, guys. That's all right. So it stopped sharing again. That's really helpful. Yeah. It should be coming up. Right. Okay. Can you see a bunch of slides down the side there? Ooh, hopefully not yet. Oh, it's coming. It's a bit better. It's a bit, it's quite pixelated. I have to say that actually. Oh, that's such a shame. Can you see a big slide now? Not just one big slide. We've still, oh. we've still got the other ones. I don't understand this. I don't know <sighs> if it would help Ingrid, if you wanted to send your slides. I don't know how big the presentation is. And I'll um, do you know screen. what? I could I could just chat through it, but I'm yeah. oh, it's I, I, very frustrating. If you can see the slides here, along with my notes, I'll just batter on using that if that's okay. Yeah, let's keep it going. Yeah, because we've not got a huge amount of time. No. Okay, so um, yes, I'm the Heritage Engagement Officer for Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, and we are a charity that repairs, restores, and repurposes historic buildings across the uh, Glasgow area. And our current project is down on Glasgow Green. It's the West Boathouse, and that's it here. Um, it's, this is in its pre-restoration state, um, which if you were being generous, uh, you might describe it as shabby chic. Um, actually, very, very close to sliding into the river is probably a more... Um, accurate uh, description of it, but no longer. It's um, it's almost complete now. So it was built in 1905 for the two rowing clubs that are still based in the building. That's Clydesdale Amateur Rowing Club and Clyde Amateur Rowing Club. And both those clubs have a heritage that goes back to the mid 1800s. And over that time, there's assumed, uh, quite a substantial uh, collection of sporting heritage. The building is Category B listed and um, as I said earlier, we're almost finished now with the restoration works and getting ready uh, to get underway with getting the collections back in and redisplayed. My role in the project is really to engage with um, communities, not just around about the boathouse and the rowing community themselves, it's uh, communities along the stretch of the river here. Um, that you can see lined out in yellow, right up to the Cunninger Loop. That's the rowing reach. That's the extent that the rowers use on, uh, yeah, when they're when they're rowing, um, and it cuts through the east end of the city, through some of the most economically deprived areas in in Europe. Um, in terms of heritage, it's a part of the city that's that's really been um, sorely sorely neglected. Um, but has a huge appetite for heritage and for, for telling their stories. Um, something else that we, we come up against uh, constantly is that um, heavy emphasis on, on shipbuilding uh, in terms of those kind of narratives around about the Clive, and it tends to drown out everything else. Um, so we're trying to kind of redress that balance a little bit too. And uh, here's a nice image um, of them getting the 
roof redone uh, back in February this year. Um, and just before I get into the collections, I'll just give you a really kind of rapid overview of some of that community engagement work. And some of it does involve uh, archives, including this project here. Um, so um, the other month there, we finished making a film with Riverbank Primary School in Dalmarnock, and we used uh, an archive film of the area from the 1960s as a kind of springboard for uh, for getting the kids to think about what it takes to make a community. Um, that area around Dilmarnock was was pretty much um, flattened uh, actually in advance of the Commonwealth Games and it's a community now kind of rebuilding after years and years of um, a complete lack of investment. Um, so that was a really, it was a fantastic project to work on actually and uh, really interesting to see the power of, of archives in that context. We've also built two skiffs with uh, Glasgow Disability Alliance and <clears throat> GDA have been a kind of core partner. We've got another project underway with them at the moment. Um, while there is a lot of sporting heritage, a lot of uh, what we're working on is really focused on the river and we've taken a kind of holistic approach. So blending that natural and cultural heritage, tangible and tangible in, uh, tangible heritage too. Um, it's a recovering river. As you can see that water sample from 1874. Um, and I went down and took another sample from 2020 just to do a little bit of a compare and contrast. So uh, we're headed in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, another project we're working on is uh, recording um, wildlife along the river and banks along that six kilometer stretch. Um, again, it, it's, uh, it's not really been looked at from that perspective before. That project's called the Living River and I Naturalist is an app uh, that allows people to record observations and then upload their findings to a massive citizen science project. Uh, we've also uh, been working on a project called Play Like a Lassie. That's been a partnership with Glasgow Caledonian University. It wasn't part of the original programme and it kind of, uh, it came about kind of organically, partly in a response to, to COVID and that move towards um, more digital online engagement. Um, but it's really about um, raising awareness uh, and visibility uh, of kind of women's bios, women's stories in a sporting heritage con context on Wikipedia. So we've had a team of volunteers working on that um, on and off over the last kind of year or so now. Um, and that's been going great. And obviously they're using archives as well to um, source a lot of content for their articles. It's a, a mixture of um, kind of uh, current uh, women who are currently active in sport and, uh, and historic case studies. Um, another project that uh, is, puts a heavy reliance on archives is um, our Mapping Sport in Glasgow project. That's um, mostly been uh, Tam McCann that's been working on that. One of our volunteers, he was also involved in the film um, and he's been beavering away um, mapping uh, historic and modern sites and places associated with sport in the Glasgow area. So looking at it from a landscape perspective, and I think he's got just over a thousand sites mapped now, and that's everything from, you know, football pitches to uh, bowling greens, you know, uh, golf courses, street names, and also manufacturing. Uh, and using that mix of kind of historic maps and newspapers, post office directories, that kind of thing. And then, of course, we have the collections. So, like most small clubs, small heritage organisations, that's what we have. It's a collection. It's a mix of objects and documents. It, it's not just an archive, and it's not like it's just a museum. There's that blend, um, and a lot of it was uh, was kind of distributed throughout the building. It was displayed. Um, and then there was a, a, a little bit of material came in then from personal collections as well. And it's very diverse. It runs from um, vintage boats uh, to these kind of onesies um, that the rowers wear. Uh, we've got minute books going back to the 1850s. We've got photos going back to the 1860s. Actually, bits of the building have been recorded as well. Um, you know, some of the old dials and stuff that came off, um, bits of the old um, render system, all that kind of stuff's being recorded too. 
So just to give you an idea of what it looked like before we, uh, we began the renovations, this is the Clydesdale Arc uh, Gymnasium. So you can see one of those boats up on the wall there. There's floors, pennants, tons of photos. Um, this is the stairwell here. Um, those, <laughs> those weird looking things on the wall, those are antlers, uh, antler trophies, um, which are going to be interesting to try and redisplay. This, I think, is our earliest photo. It's from 1862, um, uh, Clydesdale Amateur Rowing Club. Um, we have minute books. I just want to say it was not me who put that sticker on the front of it. That was uh, club members a few years ago. Um, and the first thing we did when we went in and what kind of condition it was in, a lot of this material had been kind of stuffed in an attic um, and there was quite a lot of kind of damp uh, and, and water damage. Um, when it came to actually getting into the nuts and bolts of it, the recording and, and cataloguing. We had a lot of uh, support from Glasgow Museums and from some of the interns that we've worked with. And we trialled a, a variety of um, systems to find a way uh, to catalogue that mix of material in a way that wouldn't be too, that would be accessible for volunteers, nice and easy to use. Um, and in the end, we, we developed our own system. So it's got a, a Google form front end and then that publishes just a, a simple spreadsheet. Um, and this is our kind of workflow running through. So, so volunteers um, have that opportunity to kind of see the whole process through. Um, it's also quite a nice system uh, in terms of uh, importing and exporting information. The more simple you keep it, the better. And a, a spreadsheet is, uh, is about as simple as you can get, really. Um, Ingrid, and... can you just say your, your, frozen, your slide is frozen on collections? Oh. Oh, has it? Yeah, it's okay. We're on. We're, 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 oh, we're, sorry. I'll no, just I'm just. Going. I don't know if it's our connection here that's really bad. I'm very yeah. sorry about this. No. Um, we'll keep going. It's we... moved on actually to. Okay. Um, to uh, I can see someone with a mask on and uh, holding up. It's the digital. Oh, okay. Yes, that's uh, so. That's Tita on the right hand side there, one yeah. of the volunteers, and uh, and Alicia who's um, peering down the camera there. Um, so from the very start of this project, we wanted to find easy to use, accessible and affordable solutions to tackling a small collection. Um, and the idea being that uh, we create a resource for other kind of small organizations, small clubs to, you know, small um, heritage organizations uh, to use, um, to get them over that kind of fear factor. Um, and yeah, particularly um, being kind of creative <laughs> in terms of the equipment. So Alicia there, you can see on the left hand side, um, we have a just a DSLR camera for photographing, for capturing uh, those kind of outsized objects. If it's small enough that we can fit it on the scanner, all well and good. Um, we couldn't afford an overhead scanner, which would be ideal and what we would use in a, you know, in a, um, in an archive or a museum setting, they would have access to that, but we, we didn't. So what we used here is an old coat stand um, with a boom attached here uh, and then the camera overhead so that we could get a nice overhead shot. Um, so we've had, in terms of um, volunteering, we've had, um, I think five interns now. Um, so three from Glasgow University uh, from Museum Studies and Information Studies. Um, we've had two from Glasgow Caledonian Uni who worked on the Play Like a Lassie project. And then we've had um, around about 10 undergraduates, uh, some of whom are here today from, uh, from archaeology, um, which under, uh, under usual circumstances, you wouldn't necessarily um, find an archaeologist rifling about in an archive. Uh, it does happen, but um, yeah, that, that's been uh, a lifesaver for me, really. Um, getting the clubs, the rowers engaged with the collection side has been difficult. Um, they're very, very focused on their, on their sport, and they've been very supportive in other ways and on other project elements, but 
In terms of the, the collections, there's been a lot less engagement. They'll, um, they're happy to provide information in terms of kind of identifying people in photographs and stuff, but they have very little interest in coming in and, and uh, working through the collections. So we've relied very heavily on the students and on some of the other volunteers uh, to work through that. Um, and I think we're gonna hear from the students now. Um, so I'm wondering if this is actually gonna work. I had um, three of the interns uh, from Glasgow Uni over the last three years. So Kendall, uh, who was the last intern, She's in Florida, so a half past 12 here is something like half six in the morning. So she pre-recorded um, a, um, a little video just talking about her time on the project. So I'm gonna attempt to play that um, and we'll see how it goes. And then we'll maybe hear from some of the other volunteers. So uh, we've got, let's see, Lorna, Harris, Tam, Katie, hi. Uh, might be some others in there too. Um, we'll have a wee chat with them um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Make Your Mark programme. Um, so I'll try sharing this first. Oh, sorry. Right. Hi, my name is Kendall Fairbanks. I work with the Glasgow Building Preservation Trust in 2021 for about six months. My partnership with them was facilitated with the University of Glasgow, where I was a postgraduate student earning my degree in museum studies. Um, my program had an option for an applied dissertation, which essentially allowed students to work with a organization of their choice um, to gain a better experience in the sector and get a little bit more hands on experience. Um, once I saw the option to work with the Glasgow Building Preservation Trust um, for an applied dissertation, I was really interested in that. I think archives are really important to projects, especially ones like this where they are very history based. Um, they are the driving force essentially to the project itself. Um, I mean, the trust was able to use the archives to, you know, match paint colors to the roof tiles, um, to the building itself. Um, so it's useful not only for that purpose, but for the Roman club members themselves, or, you know, in other projects, the community members. Um, it helped them, like I said um, previously, gain a better understanding of the history of their club. I really enjoyed my time working with the trust. It really helped me um, with my the future of my career. Um, during the time of COVID, it was really difficult to get any hands-on experience, especially in my program with it being museum studies. We didn't get a lot of opportunities. So having an applied dissertation where we were able to work with organizations and gain a little bit of um, experience in the sector, it really was awesome. Um, and it really helped me in my in my career and where it stands now, um, you know, one year post-graduation. Um, so I'm really thankful for the time I had working with them. And I really look forward to seeing the West Boat House and its completed state. I'm sure it's quite different from what I saw it last year. Um, I'm really excited for them and, you know, com fully completing this project is really awesome. Um, hopefully I get to come visit soon and plan it on next year. So we'll see. Um, thank you guys. Bye. Hi, my oh. name is Kendall Fairbanks. Ah. Sorry. Right. Um, so that was Kendall, who's now got a job uh, in a museum in Florida, which is great, um, as have the other two interns. So for any of the graduating class um, archaeology this year, that's that's a pretty decent return so far. Um, and yeah, fingers crossed there'll be more jobs in the pipeline um, for a bit of experience under your belt. So. Um, I'm just going to start by asking some of the undergraduate students from this year. So Lorna Harris, and who else is here? Is Tita here? Let's see. Um, if they could maybe uh, tell us a little bit about what motivated them 
um, to come and volunteer for the West Boat House. Lorna, go for it. Um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I am a local from Glasgow South Side, so it really is on my doorstep. So firstly, just a pleasure to find out more about what's going on in your own backyard, and I really certainly have. And secondly, as you pre previously mentioned, work experience mm -hmm. it is a valuable asset, um, and I've really enjoyed it and would highly recommend it. That's yeah, no, I was just going to say I totally agree. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's been a lot of fun and it's been really interesting. And, you know, everyone at GBBT is really nice and they've made it a really like welcoming environment for someone who doesn't have a lot of experience with this kind of stuff. And it's been really, really good to actually get into something hands on because, you know, my de my degree, this entire second half of it was during the pandemic. So, you know, I didn't get a lot of like, um, you know, like, I didn't really get to go on digs. I didn't get a lot of trips. I didn't get a lot of like, you know, practical archaeological experience. But I found that, you know, working on a project like this, that this is something I actually enjoy more. <laughs> and it's something I'm more interested in. So it's, help me sort of figure out the sort of things I enjoy and the things I'm interested in and the sort of things I want to pursue going forward. So mm -hmm. I think that's been really useful as well. Yeah. Um, is Tita here? No? Okay. Um, Tam or, or Katie, you've been working on, um, on slightly different elements of the project, but still using archives a lot. Um, can I ask, the two of you um either for motivations or what you know why you wanted to get involved or um or what you've enjoyed what you've um yeah uh yeah just uh, any sort of thoughts on that Pam, i saw your hand up oh you'll need to unmute There you go. Tamina. Yeah, Tam, I can. Um, I was a black cab driver for 34 years, so know Glasgow quite well. First met Ingrid a number of years ago um, during the Weave project in Parkhead. Mm -hmm. I run a website uh, called Parkhead History, and that's how we got connected. Um, Ingrid asked me to get involved in a mapping sporting heritage project she was working on. I don't think any of the two of you thought it would grow as large as what it did. Um, I think the two of you were quite surprised at how much sport is involved in Glasgow, especially in the East End. East End, I think the more industrial side of the city, the more sport there was more football grounds, quieting, just billiard rooms, things like that. So it was an education for me, even though I know Glasgow quite well, there was, a, I found out that there was a lot yet I didn't know about. And this project uh, really brought it to life, how much there is. Um, I'm actually very grateful for get an opportunity to do it because I think it's something that's, now that it's done, it's there for MD that's doing any research into the sport of Glasgow. Um, it's a resource that's there for everybody to use. So, yeah, yeah. really enjoyed Thanks, it. Tam. No, it's, it's been a pleasure, Tam. And uh, I, yeah, he's now recorded over a thousand sites. It's a, it's a power of work. <laughs> um, Katie, how are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm um, an independent researcher um, and I'm interested in the history of women's distance running in the UK particularly. And um, I got involved with the Play Like a Lassie project, which was all about um, getting more Scottish sports women's biographies onto Wikipedia. And um, I think only 19% of, of the sort of biographical articles on Wikipedia are of women. 
So, you know, sports women are really underrepresented. And there were kind of a team of us who met virtually. And uh, it was really nice for, uh, for me uh, because I would never have, if this project had been face to face, I could never have got involved with it because I'm based in Nottingham. Um, but it was, you know, we had quite a few virtual meetups and we had a really good training session. And um, I was interested in it because I'd already done a little bit of editing in Wikipedia, but it's a bit of a scary place when you're a novice because you sort of like, there's just so much to learn and there aren't really any rules. There are just guidelines. And so, um, but I have now, I, I have actually created a, a, a Wikipedia article on the Scottish ultra runner, Trudy Thompson. So, you know, that was a good outcome from the project for me. Yeah. And it was just great being part of a team of people who were all interested in the same thing. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of gone into um, abeyance over the last couple of months, just, yeah, over the summer and just people being busy. But I'm hoping we'll get it back underway again uh, over the winter time. Um, it, it's weird because I volunteer on that project as well. <laughs> Which is an odd one, volunteering on your own kind of stuff. But anyway, I mean, I think um, like COVID had a huge impact in terms of um, particularly how uh, how we dealt with the collections because there was a, a long period where we couldn't actually have people um, in the office working in here where the collections are are currently stored. Um, and it did give us a little bit of breathing space to kind of refine um, some of the cataloging and recording techniques, but obviously we're massively behind schedule now um, with, with getting through all this material. Um, but I, I suspect, uh, well, we're not the only ones uh, in that boat. Um, so, I mean, I think maybe hear from Tessa a little bit now because, uh, so I, I got in touch with Tessa, um, what, about this time last year, I think, and said, help, please, I need, <laughs> I need some help with this. Um, and she said, I'll put a wee um, video together and we'll upload it onto YouTube and, uh, and then uh, send the link around the students. And, um, and I got a fantastic response to that and was flattering myself by thinking that it was uh, all on, uh, because of the fantastic pitch that I'd done really forgetting that Glasgow Museums weren't taking any students or any interns. Um, <laughs> and uh, obviously uh, with, with archaeology, there's a requirement for, for field work as well. But it'd um, uh, be interesting to get your perspective on that in terms of kind of how, how things have been impacted by COVID and those kind of volunteering opportunities and maybe how that's shifted uh, to slightly more unusual uh, field work opportunities. Uh, yeah, no, th thanks Ingrid and also thanks for providing the opportunity because I think, you know, just hearing from our two students there, it's it's been a quite uh, an important uh, um, opportunity. Uh, as Ingrid said, we, we require practice and practical experience because at the heart of archaeology, in any sense, um, doing and gaining skills from uh, real life situations is quite key for learning. So that's why we require our students to gain that experience. But I wanted to step back a bit because it was, as Ingrid mentioned also in her um, presentation, it's quite odd to have an archeologist perhaps, or it might seem odd to have archeologists uh, trolling around an archive. But one of the things we try to do in our degree is actually we have to shift opinions and understanding of what our discipline is. And I think it's very hard because there's a public opinion of what archaeologists do and what and how that is. But uh, we're, we're kind of, we, we know it from when we're in a discipline, but how do we get that message across? And we do that with, through our students, but we need to work harder. I just wanted to quote something from the latest updated, you know, what we use uh, quality assurance um, standards for the UK for higher education, in which our new understanding and definition of archaeology is that archaeology is an activity which enables people to understand, interpret and appreciate the tangible and intangible remains of the past and how we interact and value them in the present. And this is quite important for such a, a um, institute, um, the, the 
Glasgow Preservation Trust. I think that's the, the Buildings Preservation Trust because it is about in the present and it includes both tangible and intangible remains. So just to continue on uh, this definition, it is concerned with the understanding of humankind, not simply knowing about physical remains from all periods of the past, but also appreciating how these interconnect, influence us, and shape our understanding of people and places today and in the future. And uh, archaeology is about the joy of discovery and the creation of knowledge. And it is about the shaping and sharing of stories, some of which have been lost for some centuries, and some of which may challenge us and open us to new ways of looking at places that we live in and visit. So this de definition as people working in archaeology is, is quite broad. And we deal with humankind, you know, and human history from all times. And that's quite important um, for us to sort of instill in our students. And these opportunities that uh, Ingrid is, you know, shares with us is important for our students to actually to see that there's actually different possibilities for them to, to understand and what they can do with their degree afterwards. Um, I have to say that Ingrid has a background in archaeology herself. So, I mean, this obviously you can deal with that sort of experiences in so many different ways. And it's important for our students to go and actually see that. But there's also practical, you know, issues here, as Ingrid said that, you know, COVID, you know, and pandemic made going out and doing some of these um, traditional approaches to archaeology, which is sometimes digging or in fields or residential, very difficult for people to go and do that. And as Kara says, she wouldn't have had opportunities otherwise. So getting into an archive, doing things digitally and the way that Ingrid was able to be flexible and able to, to accommodate that has been great. That, but even without COVID, is important for our students who have, might have other commitments, um, other caring me, you know, you know, have other dependents, other situations. They can't just go away on some sort of residential excavations. So they need other sorts of forms of, of gaining opportunities. But seeing that these are um, projects that are running now, these are things that are out there in the community that are impacting things that they can actually contribute to and meaningfully contribute to because otherwise the work doesn't get done. And having that experience and seeing how they contribute directly, but also seeing the wider picture, getting involved and seeing, oh, there's challenges here, there's successes here. So that work experience, as Lorna says, that will do them instead. So it's not just theoretical um, sort of ideas of what to do, what how to do archaeology, but getting in there and actually seeing their work, making an impact, but also understanding that how it fits into that wider network of things, which is, is quite vital. And that's why we do encourage keeping on doing this. So more of these diverse projects that students can get involved in and let, letting them explore, you know, as I say, not uh, their, their idea of what archaeology is and explore actually how they can contribute is, is quite vital for going forward. And, and the meaning of it. it's not just a one-time thing, and we would like to continue and, and keep on uh, establishing different sorts of uh, uh, volunteer uh, opportunities for our students. Yeah, I think that transferable skills element's really critical, and it's um, that's that's across all um, volunteer cohorts. Everybody's bringing something uh, with them, uh, even if it's a it's an area of volunteering that, or, or, or a, a field that you have um, no prior knowledge of. You'd be coming with either, you know, maybe a local knowledge or having worked in um, in a field and not necessarily so. Oh, actually, um, so I, so for instance, Tam is um, as an ex taxi driver, like knows the East End inside out. Um, so that's above and beyond all his knowledge of the kind of local history uh, and heritage of the area, even just kind of working out the kind of geographies and stuff. That's a transferable skill. And that's something that's contributed enormously to the project. Other people are bringing other skills with them. So you don't necessarily, if you're thinking about volunteering on something um, and think, oh, I have no, no knowledge of that, I won't be able to offer anything. Um, you, you'll have it, you'll have something there to, to bring to the table always. Um, and something that we can learn from as well. It's always a, a reciprocal process, um, I think. And um, always have good biscuits on hand as well for volunteers. That's another high priority. 
decent biscuits. Um, I mean, did you find, um, I guess, with the, those kind of volunteering opportunities obviously kind of in decline, particularly with bigger organisations? Um, I wonder if some of those kind of smaller groups have maybe hoovered up um, some of that volunteer base a little bit. They've got more room to be flexible and um, not the same capacity, but uh, you know, it's not like turning a tanker. They can they can be a bit more um, responsive. Um, I wonder if that's happened or what you know whether our experience is is unusual or not. Yeah, I think you're right that some bigger institutions are, were very much, especially for, for COVID, they did they couldn't adapt very well to to new situations because they had to deal with the bigger institute, you know, um, criteria within their, their institutions. So they couldn't just go, OK, we can do some for some people and do online. They just couldn't do that, as you're saying. So, yes, I think you were more adaptable and easier to to be more flexible in that situation. So um so that you know that definitely has been worked well for our students to be able to have that um ability to go and work with you yeah um jane shall we open up to questions from the floor and a kind of general discussion audrey oh you're on mute doing this for two and a half years now i should know i know um, yes, we, we can do actually, and then I can uh, show the little film about volunteering actually, which will be. Oh yes, sorry, we've got the um, the make your mark stuff. Do you want to give a little bit of background into make your mark? Yeah, um, Scottish Council and Archives are on the board of make your mark, uh, um, and we sort of represent archives, and what we very much want to do follows the suit of make your mark, which is bringing, you know, making volunteering easy to do for people, um, but also sort of welcoming people in from all backgrounds with lots of different skills and an opportunity to sort of network and learn. Um, and I think it was Lorna that mentioned the whole idea about doing something and it's really good for your CV as well. So the idea is with Make Your Mark, it's an online portal and it's for people who are interested in volunteering in the heritage sector. Uh, but it's also for the organisations who rely very much on volunteers to do to do the work as well. And it's a safe space and uh, there's lots of training opportunities as well. And you can find out about uh, volunteering in somewhere maybe close to where you are. So you might be based, um, I'm going to say, on the Isle of Lewis and you could find out about volunteering opportunities near you. Uh, so it's not Central Bell, which we, we sometimes do spend a lot of time in Glasgow and Edinburgh and Stirling and stuff like that. So it's it's really great. So we were going to have Erin Burke, uh, the communications officer, talking today, but she has sent along a little video and I'm going to try and share my screen and I hope <laughs> this is going to work. And uh, you can let me know if it doesn't, but it's great. It lasts about five minutes. Um, and then after that, we can have a really good Q&A discussion because I have uh, put some things in the chat, but if you want to also populate the chat as well, um, and that will help us get started for a bit of a 10 minute Q&A session after the film. So I'm going to share my screen now. Let's hope this works. I have nothing dodgy on my screen. Hi everyone, I'm Erin Burke and today I'm going to give a brief introduction to Make Your Mark and our volunteer portal, which promotes heritage volunteering opportunities in Scotland. So what is Make Your Mark? Make Your Mark supports everyone in Scotland to volunteer with historical, cultural and nature organizations. The main way that we do this is by promoting volunteering opportunities from our 70 plus members. Um, so these members include museums, galleries, zoos, historic sites, monuments, parks, archives, green spaces and landscapes, and archaeological sites. So essentially, Make Your Mark connects volunteers with organizations that care for Scotland's places and stories, both new and old. To give you a sense of the 
range of volunteering opportunities that are offered by our members. I'm going to talk a bit about some current opportunities that are listed on our volunteer portal. One of the ways that you can volunteer is digital volunteering, and this may include helping to build websites, manage social media pages, caption digital archives, use digital design tools, and more. For example, the Heritage Trust Network is looking for people with digital knowledge and skills to support heritage organizations across the UK. Another way that you can volunteer is event volunteering. Event volunteering is often a one-off experience and event volunteers support the delivery of events in a range of ways like welcoming visitors, giving directions, crowd marshalling, providing information about the event, assisting with learning activities, and more. For example, right now, Historic Environment Scotland are looking for volunteers for their celebration of the Centuries event at Fort George um, in August. You could also try out garden volunteering at sites that have green spaces. Currently, the Museum of Edinburgh is looking for help to maintain their courtyard. Um, which includes planting new flowers and herbs and also interacting with visitors. Another option is library volunteering, where volunteers organize materials, maintain catalogs, and locate materials requested by staff or visitors. Right now, the National Mining Museum of Scotland is looking for volunteers to enhance their existing records and also enter information on new acquisitions. You could also be a retail volunteer, as many historical and cultural sites have gift shops or cafes. So if this is more your speed, the David Livingston Birthplace are on the lookout for volunteers to help out in their shop by stocking merchandise and assisting customers. Maybe you'd be interested in tour guide volunteering, which, you, which would see you learn about the site and deliver a tour to visitors. Currently, the National Trust for Scotland are looking for volunteer guides to show visitors around the newly refurbished Homewood House in Glasgow. So those are just a few of the opportunities that we currently have on offer. So those are all up on our volunteer portal. If you'd like to express your interest in any of those, or if you'd like to have a look at the range of other opportunities that are currently on the go, all you need to do is head to our volunteer portal at volunteer.makeyourmark.scot. Once you've done that, you'll see a page that looks like this. And to create your account, all you need to do is select the Try Volunteering Reg Now button. So you can see this on your screen here highlighted in pink just over to the left. And just to say, uh, in case anyone on the call is representing a heritage organization in Scotland that offers volunteer opportunities, you can easily register on our site um, and have your opportunities listed as well by hitting the button next to that that says need volunteers, add your opportunities. And also Make Your Mark can support your organization by sharing inclusive heritage volunteering resources. Uh, we also host inclusive heritage volunteering events, and we have a peer-to-peer -peer support network for volunteer organizers within Scotland's heritage sector. So if you're an organization and you want a bit more information about the campaign and the types of things that we offer our members, please head to our website at makeyourmark.scot. Okay, so back to getting registered on our site as a volunteer. So once you create a profile, so that you do that again, by clicking that uh, button that says try volunteering that we saw on the previous screen. So once you create your profile by filling out a short form with your email and other personal details, you can browse the opportunities available. And then also by creating a profile, you will receive regular emails notifying you about any new opportunities that have been added onto the site. So, finally, if you have any questions about Make Your Mark in general or how to use the volunteer portal, please don't hesitate to contact me at hello at makeymark.scot. So thank you for your time today. Um, and again, please email me if you have any questions. Great, thank you. Um, 
and also just to say we have we have recorded the whole session so you can see Erin's video if you want to check anything out but I think I put the Twitter handle on the chat as well um, so really this is the point where in grid we we can people can unmute and they can ask their questions I I did have a question if I can get in there first though I was uh, interested to know how the volunteers at Glasgow Building Preservation Trust actually heard about um, the volunteering opportunities. Ah, uh, a mix really. Some of it um, was direct contacts with, with people that I, I knew, for instance, like um, Tessa Poller uh, and um, player like a lassie that was through um, Dr. Fiona Skillen at Glasgow Cali Uni, she's a um, sports historian. Um, in terms of <clears throat> general call outs, um, we've had, so um, we have like a sort of sign up sheet, so I'll, I'll, I'll distribute emails and stuff to, to some of our kind of uh, people who've expressed an interest come along to events and that kind of thing. To be honest, uh, because it's just me, I did laugh when you mentioned my team. <laughs> <laughs> it's like um i i don't have the capacity to manage a large group of volunteers so it, it tends to be a little bit more episodic um volunteering in response to a particular kind of project or uh, or event um and the rowers um i do i do have them volunteering quite a bit but for different elements um of the project and they're quite good if you if you set them at a task, they're like an exocet missile, they can engage with it, but they're they're not interested in sort of longer term volunteering, but that's okay. We have lots of different kind of levels of volunteering and, and some of it's longer term, some of it's very episodic. Um, and I do try to offer different options for people to accommodate that kind of, um, you know, fitting it in with other demands on their life. Um, and I think overall, we've got better at doing that in the heritage sector over the last couple of years in response to COVID. So there's there's more opportunities for those kind of, um, I kind of the term makes me feel a little bit itchy, but those kind of micro volunteering uh, kind of things um, or, you know, getting involved with a, a project like Play Like a Lassie, which, you know, was pretty intensive. Um, but then that also led on to, on to another project, uh, having learned from Play Like a Lassie, which is, is quite um, it's quite a big ask of volunteers, and you have to be quite confident in, uh, in writing and researching. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a kind of follow on from that that just kind of got underway with Glasgow Disability Alliance and a couple of other um, groups uh, called Wiki Walks, which is going around and doing the same thing, essentially, uh, trying to plug those kind of um, gaps in, in Wikipedia, but from the visual and um, uh, kind of archive sense more uh, through Wikipedia Commons and, and adding in photographs and, um, and film of, of places that are underrepresented. Um, so it, yeah, it's a kind of, I could be a lot better at, um, at managing my volunteers, to be fair. I feel. Yeah. No, uh, I think that's interesting. I, I was wondering to know, like, I don't know, like maybe Lorna or Tam, are you still volunteering with Glasgow Building Preservation Trust? Yeah, so, I mean, it's been quite a long time. Lorna's nodding, I can see. Can you unmute, Lorna? Yes, I can. That's me. Yes, and I think it's... Uh, it's going to go until next spring, did we say, Ingrid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's never going to end, Lorna. I'll be there. I'm, I'm there for the I'm there for the grand opening. Um, I'll be there. Yeah, I, I want to. Oh, yeah, the grand opening. Tell us about yes. that, Ingrid, actually. Sorry, because that is, that's oh, a, maybe that's a treat for the volunteers as well. Are we all are we going to be there? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it's kind of, it's up in the air at the moment um, because we're we're behind schedule and we're getting into the winter and it needs to be something that's water-based. So I suspect it's going to be pushed over now into the spring. Um, but yeah, I can, I can tell you a bit more about that. But I think Tam was going to say something, were you? Um, I think as long as you're enjoying it, you'll keep mm -hmm. doing it. And for me, um, it's just learning more about Glasgow. The more projects you get involved with, the more you learn. 
Yeah. And that's it for me, really. Tam, yeah. are you keen to get onto the water? Because I, I, I've had a visit and they're pretty scary for me anyway. Those They're very thin. Those well, I, I can go back many, many years ago when I was at school and we actually done the rowing. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Riverside School in mm -hmm. Parkhead, which was on the Clyde. And part of our sort of sports was to yeah. go along to the boat, the boat houses mm -hmm. and do the, the, the eight-man skiffs. Uh, it'll be the yeah the big eights, uh, which are about nineteen meters long or something. That, um, that was a long, long time ago. But no, I'm not yeah. interested in going back in the water. <laughs> we could get you. I so will stick to taxis. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are hoping actually that we'll have um, more opportunities to get people out on the water in more accessible craft in the future because uh, at the moment. Um, there's a definite lack of that. It's all very focused on the on the very very skinny skelf like rowing boats, um, the racing shells. Um, but there's been an explosion of kind of interest in coastal rowing, and that's um, that's much more accessible. It's wider, more stable boats. So we're hoping to get them down and, and get more folk out that way. Yeah, yeah. Rowing's an interesting one, and I'm not. Um, it's not part of my job to try and necessarily recruit for the clubs or or persuade the general public that uh, that it's not an elite sport and heavily biased towards kind of white middle classes because that's for them to do. They need to, uh, you know, be more inclusive, and they are. The clubs are working towards that, but okay. it's an interesting sport, I think, from. Uh, uh, from the from the heritage perspective, if you look at sports like football, um, and you talk to some of the volunteers at like the Hamden Collection, um, they have a huge number of people who are really interested because football is a huge spectator sport. There's a massive fan base, and they're interested in that heritage. The rowers are less so interested in it. Um, I think because that culture of kind of um, of spectating and and watching. Uh, disappeared a long time ago when they did away with betting on races. <laughs> I think that was the big driver in the past. I, do, I have, maybe have one question I'd like to maybe put to Tessa. Um, you know, I know you're in archaeology, but in the archives, there is a lot of people who volunteer even to get onto the course um, mm -hmm. at Glasgow University, uh, which is a postgraduate course. Um, which is a, is a great thing, but it is a it's a cost. You know, you need to have the time um, and not be working or not working full time to do it. Do you, do you, is that an issue at all? Do you think, or is there things you you do? Yeah, to no, it can be an issue definitely for for people to find um, um, volunteering uh, opportunities in which it fits around also just also their schedules. Lots of people have very different schedules and abilities. And we we actually cut our number of hours uh, and days that we've asked students to do and we also I mean we offer our own opportunities that are no you know cost to students so it's a cost to us to run so there's other opportunities that do, do that but I think things like this that are flexible that could be done within the course time maybe or could be done over I mean, I mean, Lorna's still doing it and she's above and beyond obviously the number of hours that she needs but there's there's, you can, you can fit it in, you know, and that's the importance of, you know, having a diverse um, uh, range of, of opportunities and especially for archives and things like that. I think that those are things that you can actually do maybe an hour here, a couple of hours there, you know, sort of thing that you can build up and be flexible with in order to make it a bit more alleviated. You don't have to go away to some other country or go away to even residential to stay away costs of travel, costs of those sorts of things. And if they're especially digital or things that you could do online and, you know, again, that doesn't necessarily take much more co like cost for that. So it is a problem, I think, for longer for longer term and also things like when you get into postgraduate and and asking for placements uh, for 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 students and that that's a big problem because not only the the time I say Ingrid is a team of one but the time it takes to uh for somebody to help train somebody you know in the new skills for them to do 
things, it takes a lot of work. And especially if you have to juggle different people of different. So it really is a resource. They're getting benefit. So it's, it's really balancing that out sometimes. And therefore, some groups or some institutions don't want to necessarily take that on too much or they're restricted. And therefore, it may not meet all the number of students that somebody has in postgraduate level. So it's really difficult. So more variety of volunteering and, and getting people in early so that they can schedule it in with their different times is important. I think that, you know, we, we try to manage it, manage it in different ways. We also offer sort of, I guess, we're going to work with Ingrid to do a, a a course part of our course is getting a stu student to get workplace you know experience and and we do offer that as a course so that they're getting credit for that it's not just ad additional to so again those are ways we're trying to get students those experiences as well as part of their their um their teaching but as i say it's variable but trying to find minimizing how much they need to do but realizing it's important and finding that balance for students you know in terms of finance and time and how that is balanced but I think we can keep on having different you know as I say relations of with other people and things like make your mark and things like that would be a good opportunity for mm -hmm. our students to try to find the diversity that might suit their needs yeah and, and maybe I think part of the whole COVID and lockdown, we are doing so much more online. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Katie, I imagine you were doing your Wikimedia stuff from home rather than um, having to travel or anything and, and fitting it in with maybe other work commitments. So as you say, the variety is good, isn't it? If you can have a variety of different volunteering um, skill, you know, jobs, that'd be brilliant, actually. Although I quite like meeting people. I mean, I quite like to meet you all actually in person. <laughs> You, know, you want to come and volunteer, Audrey? Well, you know, I did quite, I, you know, unlike Tam, I'm quite keen to get on that water actually and have a go. <laughs> well, maybe, um, summer, maybe this summer, next summer. I, I finally got to meet Ingrid after sort of seeing her on the screen for about a year because I, uh, I went to um, Edinburgh and Glasgow for a research trip in June. So, I, you know, I got to have a tour of the boathouse and uh, meet Ingrid as well. It was really interesting. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah, it's quite good that mix, actually, isn't it? I suppose, mm. isn't it? Having been yeah. able to do both is it, it, quite nice. Um, it's great. I'm looking at the time, sorry. And I know yeah. we, we said lunchtime. We said lunchtime. Um, is there anyone before we, we go away? Because we are going to be doing another webinar. Uh, not about volunteering, but we're going to be looking at another aspect about uh, placemaking, and uh, we will be doing that, I think, in early part of September, uh, the 4th, I think. Uh, we'll contact you, but as I say, uh, if you're on Twitter, please, you know, follow us, and you'll be kept up to date, but also if you go to the website, and I think you've seen us put the link in, um, all of that will come up as well, and uh, I very much hope you will join us uh, for the next webinar as well. Um, and if you have any comments, you can contact myself or you can contact Ingrid or whoever you, you want. And we will definitely take on board any of your comments as well um, and include them. So I just want to say thank you to Ingrid and all your fantastic volunteers and to Tessa as well. Uh, Ingrid, is there anything you'd like to say before we... Before yeah, we... just a, a big thank you to all the volunteers for, uh, for turning up today. I'm very sorry about that presentation. Um, I don't know what the issue was there, um, bad connection or something. Um, and yeah, the, if you want a, a more kind of detailed overview of that um, uh, process that we've been through with the collections uh, and some reflections on that, um, I've done four blog pieces now, I think, for SCA um, that are available on the SCA website. So um, yeah, if you want to check that out, go there. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you in September. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye. Bye. Um,